not just what was going to happen in terms of a macro picture of commodity cycles, but specifically what is going to face Australia when we talk about where our cycle is at the moment and where mining investment is as a whole. So if I can start just in terms of a basis for what it means in terms of commodity cycles. When we talk about a super cycle, there has been three when we talk about from the beginning of 1900. All of them, if you talk about the American industrialization, the post-war Europe and, and Japanese industrialization, and of course the China boom, they have all been driven by the undercurrent of we are trying to urbanize, we are effectively going to see demand pull for commodities across energy, mining, agriculture, and the length of time of these commodity cycles is about 20 to 70 years. So when we talk about commodity super cycles, I can't stress that historically it has been broad-based, right? And when we talk about what is the common thematic now, right, is that we're looking at almost a specialized commodity cycle when we talk about the energy transition. In particular, you know, and, and we've seen charts like this all over the place, is how much of an increase are we going to see for these green metals or, or transition metals? Now, the degree of increase is so contingent on a few select factors. One is, in the energy transition itself, how much of a demand increase are we going to see? You know, lithium, for example, even if you assume the status quo, which is about a 2.6 degree increase in global temperatures relative to the pre-industrial age, we're still talking you know, 3.5 to 4, 4 times increase in lithium supply from 2022 to 2030. You know, we are talking a significant increase when we say lithium, but you look at the other commodities, a 1.3 to 1.4 times increase is still very substantial. And this is just assuming status quo. Now keep in mind Paris Agreement is 2 degrees and ideally below. And now if you try and factor that into the equation, you have far more ambitious increases in, in mining that's required. Now this is the first differentiation when we talk about the energy transition and the, the super cycle that will ensue, is that you're effectively saying that we are going to favor green metals over fossil fuels. Now that is going to be the first when we look at commodity cycles since 1900, commodity super cycles that is. Now another major feature of the super cycles in the past has been how much capex is spent. Now this was touched on in, in the panel before and even in, in, the, in the first talk today. But what I really wanted to stress is have a look at how much capex is being spent as a share of cash flow from operations. Now, when we talk about oil and gas, this is what you should expect, is that as fossil fuel investment becomes increasingly hard, those, industry, those fossil fuel industries are returning more money back to shareholders. You know, it's margin protection, they can't invest capex, so that money is going back. But if we're seeing a, a fall in that ratio for oil and gas, we need to see a commensurate increase in the mining side. And if you look at that chart there on the right, we're not. We are hovering near 20-year lows. And the, the reasons that were discussed just previously in the panel really explain all of this. We are seeing a massive focus on dividends. We're seeing a massive focus on, on reducing your operating costs. But more than any of that, we're seeing a massive push right now to decarbonize current operations. Now, when you look historically at this ratio, the China boom is one that strikes you almost immediately. If you look at 2012 and you look at where that ratio went to, companies were willing to spend their capex for the marginal ton. For those that are arguing that a, a, a cycle, a green commodity super cycle is imminent, I would say, where is the capex to show that like it has historically? And so this is now going to be the challenge for the industry, is how do we get capex to come back into a sector for, for miners? Now this actually raises probably the biggest point in terms of some of the risks that we're facing when we talk about what if supply doesn't respond in time. A lot of these targets we're talking about is by 2030. 
And the reality is, is that we are going to see a demand response if we don't see miners come to the party like we've seen before. Now, where will the demand response really come from? We're already seeing evidence that the battery chemistries and the EV supply chain is very nimble in their response. Five years ago, if you told me that lithium ferrophosphate as a battery chemistry was going to become as popular as it would be now, no one would believe you. But if you look at a forecast, even from 2022, about a supply constraint scenario, look at how big that purple bar comes in, the, in that chart on the left. That is lithium ferrophosphate. I'm sorry, that's, that's hard to identify in the chart. But it gives you some sense that in a supply constrained world, what you're going to see battery chemistries gravitate towards is the least resource intensive chemistry. Now, in terms of what that means across commodities, you can see that cobalt and nickel are the ones that are hurt the most. Lithium certainly has more protection if we look at a scenario like that. Now, this is analysis from the International Energy Agency, but it gives you a sense that the, the, the assumption that, yes, this demand has to increase in the way that we suspect right now, there are still so many risks in terms of this equation. Now, when it comes to lithium ferrophosphate and the chemistry that has dominated, it actually had, had come from Chinese battery maker Cattle. When we talk about the breakthroughs that Cattle has made in lithium ferrophosphate, it, it has been unbelievable. Now, this, this company, you know, it, it pioneered almost, or before it was called Cattle and was ATL, it had pioneered lithium iron cost reductions, you know, in the 2000s. In three years, it had already become, from a Chinese production point of view, lower cost than, than Korea in three years after adopting a lithium ion license. So when we talk about Cattel and what they've managed to achieve in electric vehicles already, they managed to already push the envelope in terms of making this industry low cost already. They are responsible for not only just chemistry breakthroughs, they have actually done cell-to-pack innovation and architecture improvement to the point that LFP is now no longer a concern when it comes to range anxiety for light vehicles. You know, we're talking the ability to now drive passenger vehicles 250 to 300 kilometers without nickel and without cobalt. You know, th these are real breakthroughs when we talk about how cattle has evolved. And while lithium has a lot going for it, the one thing that's worth noting on the horizon is Cattell's focus on sodium ion. Now, if you look at what is proposed over the next five years, Cattell is certainly interested in pushing for significant gigawatts hours of, of, of sodium ion capacity in the market. Now, this is something that, in our view, is, is worth watching and watching closely. Because when we talk about sodium ion, it is significantly lower cost than LFP if you take the Cattell approach, which for those who can't see it, they've gone for that Prussian white technology approach. Now this for us is where it all gets very interesting because as much as we're sitting here talking about Australia sitting on 50, 55% of the world's lithium, if prices don't come down, if battery chemistries evolve very quickly, what we have is a demand partner that is willing to change very quickly to the lowest cost and more resource abundant solution. So this is now what, what is facing the industry is how do battery chemistries evolve over the next few years. The one thing that I would say when we look at, at what's happening with sodium ion versus lithium is they are actually got a much longer lifetime. So when, when you're looking at applications, stationary storage, so you're talking um, battery storage for the power sector, lithium ion is, sorry, sodium ion is looking very much the winner in, in, in that race. But if by 2025 we see breakthroughs in terms of energy density for this um, sodium ion chemistry, it actually will signal a massive change in evolution of, of battery chemistries. But these are some of the risks that I just really wanted to point out that just sitting on, on the expectation that yes, supply needs to increase given current technology, really hasn't been the state of play for how China, and particularly Cattell, has approached battery chemistries in the last 10 years. 
So the question now comes, what about Australia? Now, if you look at what has happened in Australia in terms of mining investment, we peaked in 2012 at just over $250 billion. That was the China boom. If we look at where mining investment was last year, it was around $83 billion. Now, when we look at the breakdown of this investment, it is still the old economy. We're talking gas, we're talking iron ore, and we're talking coal as by far the most dominant avenues of investment in Australia. So then we look further down the list and you look at lithium and that's 6% and that's sizable given its smaller share of production in Australia. So lithium is certainly attracting attention. But if you look at what is dominant right now in terms of actual committed investment, it is really coming in the form of the old economy. So what's the outlook? Now this comes from the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources and their own outlook, which they have caveated that, you know, we could see more committed investment come through, but have a look at how subdued that investment profile is, which excludes hydrogen. You can see that we're talking 40 to 50 million, uh, 40 to 50 uh, billion in terms of investment annually, but nowhere near the China boom that we saw 250 billion plus. Now, when we look at that profile and we talk about Australia's opportunity and its replication of, of an economic boom, particularly in WA and Queensland like we saw previously, we would actually need to see a sizable increase in investment to make that happen. And if you look at what is in the pipeline, it is still possible if you start including hydrogen. So if you look at that, that, that table there on the right, about 40% of what is feasible so the next most advanced stage in the pipeline, and there's about nearly 300 billion in that category, 40% of that is, is hydrogen related. If you look at what is publicly announced, which is even further behind, roughly around 250 billion, about 60% of that is hydrogen. So if we're really talking about a super cycle and for Australia to see a mining investment boom like it saw with the China boom, we're going to have to see hydrogen play a role alongside battery, me battery metals. So now we get to, I guess, the next major conversation topic, which has been talked about to death in the media, but certainly is going to gain far more traction as we get to the lead up of the release of Australia's critical mineral strategy, is how much of our industry is upstream and what's the pool to go downstream. You can see from that chart on the left, over 90% of the industry, when we look at from a committed stage, from a publicly announced stage, from a feasible stage, is all related to upstream, which Australia has consolidated. In, and the question is, can it move downstream in a sustainable way? Now, we have seen downstream movement already. If we talk about lithium chemicals, Chemitin and Quinana, we have certainly seen investment. But what is really notable about this investment is that if you compare it with like for like in other jurisdictions, it is still significantly expensive. So, for example, if you will build lithium chemicals in Korea, it would be about 40% cheaper according to POSCO. If you're talking about building it in South America, we're talking 25 to 50% cheaper. And if you're talking about China, we're talking two to three times cheaper. So these are really the battlegrounds in terms of this transition. And what Australia is trying to do, combined with what we're seeing in terms of policy around the world, is moving downstream. And you can see that, that chart on the right, just how much China dominates that supply chain when we look past the, the upstream. When you go to chemicals, when we talk about EV and, and, and lithium-ion battery chains, and then you look at what's happening photovoltaic, it is absolutely dominated by China across the board. So can Australia and can the rest of the world, particularly advanced economies, really play in that zone? So the example that has often been touted as a success has been Indonesia. Now this for me has been one of the most overrepresented examples of what managed to succeed but actually could have failed a lot of times along the way. When we talk about Indonesia, in 2009, they announced that they were going to ban the export of, of nickel ore 
in 2014. So you can see there from the chart on the left, of course, <laughs> nickel ore exports boomed until that point, and then it fell off a cliff. Now, for the next two years, nickel ore production completely declined in, in Indonesia. When it came down to who actually came in and stepped up in terms of investment, it was actually Sing Shan and its founder, Xiang Guangda. Um, Guangda. In terms of what Sing Shan had done, I, I cannot say w without enough emphasis, they have revolutionized the nickel industry. What Sing Shan did when nickel prices jumped at the end of the, the, two, the 2000s was pioneer the nickel pig iron process by using nickel laterite ores. Complete game changer and allowed a different process route for nickel, for nickel pig iron and stainless steel. But in 2009, what they did in response to protectionism from, from, from Indonesia was effectively double down on investment to build out their downstream processing. No one followed them, they took the bet on themselves. And what they managed to do, the Indonesian government welcomed them, gave them hundreds of acres to develop, and they built out the entire supply chain from roads to power to nickel, to stainless steel to nickel pig iron. And you can see that chart there on the right shows you ferro nickel exports out of Indonesia, and it's increased. Now, you look at that on face value, it's like it worked. If you do protectionism, it ends up supporting the industry. But if you look more closely without what Sing Shan managed to do, this would have never been possible. They doubled down when everyone else left. And in terms of their ability to get to a low cost producer base, they're unparalleled. Sing Shan, when they went to Indonesia, they set themselves up as the lowest cost stainless steel producer in the world. And now as they move into almost your battery grade nickel, what they're doing in terms of investment in downstream has been nothing but extraordinary. You know, they are looking to convert class two nickel into class one. They're looking to high pressure acid leaching. What they're doing downstream is an absolute game changer. But it takes Sing Shan and the brains behind it in order to change an industry. It takes one entrepreneur who took massive risks to make this happen. And so this is almost a lesson that, yes, we saw success, but can it be repeated? It is basically now, if you look at Indonesia's nickel industry, an extension of the Chinese arm. That is where the innovation, that is where the expertise sits when we talk about processing and processing at low cost. So the question comes down to Australia and what, what they can do. Because it's not just about dislocating from the Chinese supply chains. It's now a story of now what is the rest of the world doing, in particular the US and Europe. Now, if you look at, uh, along that chain, there's been a lot of interest in Australia to go down the battery value chain. Can we do not just batteries? What about PV? What about wind? How many supply chains can we get involved in? Because at the end of the day, we're doing the upstream. Why don't we have a manufacturing sector? Now, Australia is competing with heavy, heavy subsidies from the rest of the world. When we look at the Inflation Reduction Act, we're talking 369 billion US being spent. When you talk about Europe, we're talking about 250 billion euro being spent. The question is, where is Australia's competitive advantage? Because when you look at this, this lens, you can see that the, at least the processing side is at least low in terms of priorities for both US and Europe. And in my view, this is where the opportunity sits. Processing is an avenue that makes sense and why, even though it's more expensive, when we say compare, say, lithium hydroxide here versus places like, you know, South Korea, the benefit of doing it domestically and shipping less in terms of content actually helps the economics work. And so far, we're seeing that investment work because they are looking to expand both Kemetin and Quinana. But when we fundamentally look at this picture, the question of subsidies and what has China done that is so different is that their industry has been protected too. There's, there's no two ways about it. Their EV supply chain basically grew on the back of subsidies worth probably around 60 billion in the 2010s. But what China did very differently is behind the subsidies, they became the lowest cost producer by a, by a significant margin. 
So the entry was protected, but then they quickly became the lowest cost producer. You look at Cattel, you look at Singshan, you look across the board, what China does when it does manufacturing is that it gets to the lowest point. And this for me is one of the key lessons that we talk about Australia and what Australia can do is that if we subsidize this industry and we are probably going to head down that way and probably going to get support from the US, the big question I'm going to say is, are we going to subsidize and behind that become lowest cost? Or are we going to subsidize and just become a high cost producer in this space? Because it is about getting to the lowest cost because that is where the economics sit and that is what will drive actual decarbonization, not just in Australia and advanced economies, but we're talking in the developing world, where if you're very serious about climate change, that is where the, te the actual technology has to be adopted. The other key part of the opportunity for Australia, for me, comes down to industrial hubs. When we look around Australia, there are key industrial sectors from Gladstone to Pilbara to Quinana, and then down in the Hunter and Illawarra regions in New South Wales. Now, these sectors have synergies if you can have common infrastructure. Now, in terms of where the opportunity sits with Australia, I would say it is actually linked to the hydrogen opportunity. Now, economics of hydrogen are going to be difficult to establish right now. And in reality, its real bulk usage will probably be a 2030 plus story. But what makes hydrogen such an attractive opportunity is that it is so difficult to transport. It is so expensive. You lose so much of the contained energy, whatever way that you, you, you export it, whether it's liquefied, whether it's a hydrogen carrier, or whether it's, it's, it's in an ammonia derivative. But this is where the opportunity sits, because it makes far more sense to actually use that hydrogen locally, go downstream a little bit, and then export that, because it's much cheaper than doing the alternative, which is exporting hydrogen and having that done offshore. So when we talk about iron ore, this is where the sen it can make sense to go down direct reduced iron. But hydrogen can also be used in other sectors. Chemicals certainly has the potential, and that's the easiest in terms of technology, because they just have to go from gray hydrogen to green hydrogen. But even when it comes to processing downstream, both alumina and nickel need high heat. And ultimately, that's the final phase of their decarbonization. And hydrogen allows that high heat to come through. So all up, that's really the opportunity that we see when we talk about Australia's decarbonization future, is that it's targeted, it's select, but it has to be done with a premise that if you're going to go behind subsidies, you reduce your costs to be the lowest cost. So thank you.